I recently made a short video that sparked a lot of questions and a little confusion about a topic that many of you may have heard about before. That topic is ISO invariance and talking about what it is, which cameras have it, and how you can use it to benefit your own photography. I'm Austin James Jackson, a landscape photographer based in Utah, and in this video, I am looking forward to teaching you guys about what you need to know about ISO invariance and ISO invariance sensors, including how to find out if you've got one and how you can use it to your own advantage in your photography. Now, this topic is loaded with technicalities and definitions that are hard to understand. I'm going to do my best to break things down for you in a way that's going to make sense to even the most novice of photographers. Now, first things first, let's define what ISO invariance is. The quick and dirty answer is that an ISO invariant camera will produce the same image regarding image quality when you capture an underexposed photo with a low ISO as if you would have captured a properly exposed photo with a higher ISO using the same shutter speed and aperture. Many people would refer to this as an ISO-less camera, uh, since the ISO doesn't matter if you have your shutter speed and aperture at the best setting. While this is partially true, we're going to talk a little bit more about this later. But before we continue, let me mention that we will be talking about digital cameras and ISO in the digital realm. When you raise the ISO, it creates an artificial signal amplification to brighten the image. Unlike in film photography, where you're taught that higher ISOs increase the sensitivity of the film to light. To show ISO invariance as an example, I'm going to show you guys this image, which I severely underexposed at ISO 400. Then I took another properly exposed image at ISO 6400 without changing the shutter speed or aperture from that first ISO 400 shot. In post-processing, I brought up the exposure of the ISO 400 image plus four stops to match the exposure of the ISO 6400 image, which, as you can see, it resulted in two perfectly matched exposures. Now, when you zoom in, you can see that the two images look exactly identical, indicating ISO invariance on my camera sensor. You can do this test yourself, too, if you want to know if your camera's ISO invariant by doing the same thing that I did. Ensure that the shutter speed and aperture stay the same and only change the ISO when you're doing this test. If you don't want to do the test yourself, you can search the web and try and find out if your camera's ISO invariant. Chances are you're going to be able to find someone somewhere that did the test that can tell you. Camera manufacturers, unfortunately, don't list ISO invariants as a feature on their cameras, so you'll have to browse the web if you don't want to test yourself. Now, generally speaking, it seems like most full-frame mirrorless cameras and even some DSLRs are ISO invariant, but you should definitely do your research before putting what you learn in this video to practice. So, why exactly is ISO invariance important then? The truth is that ISO invariance gives the photographer less to think about in the field. If your camera is truly ISO invariant, your ISO doesn't matter as long as your shutter speed and aperture are correct. There's countless applications where this could be helpful. Let me give you a personal experience where I was able to use this. In the middle of the day a few years ago, I was photographing professional kayakers going off some pretty major waterfalls in the Pacific Northwest. Sunlight was breaking through the clouds, creating light that was rapidly changing from bright to dark. I knew I needed my shutter speed at 1 500th of a second or faster. I wanted my aperture down to f2.8 for shallow depth of field. Now when the sun was hitting, I could bring my ISO all the way down to 200, but in the shade, if I wanted a proper exposure, I'd need more like ISO 800 or even higher. Now rather than trying to worry about adjusting the ISO as the light changed, I just set my ISO to 200, shot my images even once the light went away. In this situation, I had one opportunity to capture the great photo. I didn't want to be messing with my settings to miss the moment. Now the actual images when the kayaker went off the waterfall were super underexposed because of this, but I was able to brighten the image in post-processing without having any worse image quality than if I would have set my ISO to 800 or higher in the field. This concept is exactly the same when it comes to wildlife photography, and you can realistically shoot all of your wildlife images at your camera's base ISO and then brighten in post. Now as a brief note, I want to mention another interesting ISO feature that many cameras have, which is called dual gain ISO. This refers to the camera sensor being ISO invariant in two different ranges. I don't want to get into it too much, but this essentially means that the camera may have less noise at a higher ISO than it would at a lower ISO. 
This means that the camera's got two native ISO settings and the second native ISO that is higher may actually display less noise than a lower ISO that's above the first native ISO. I know that's hard to wrap your head around, but if this is your camera, keep in mind because you will see better results around that second native ISO than you would by raising the first native ISO. To put it into a quick example, I'm gonna mention that my Sony ZV-E1, which I'm filming this video on, does have dual native ISO as the first ISO appears to be about 640, while the second native ISO is around 12. 12,800. At ISO 12,800, I can actually get a much cleaner image than I could at ISO 6400 due to the dual native ISO, even though ISO 6400 is half of 12,800. Now, when photographers hear all this information, they think that their ISO simply doesn't matter, which is true, but it must be taken with precautions. The ISO doesn't matter as long as your shutter speed and aperture are dialed in perfectly, but for the cleanest images, you always want to capture as much light as possible using the shutter speed and aperture and then tapping into the ISO and or the exposure slider and post-processing to make up any insufficiencies. You can use auto ISO, but I always recommend against it because it can get you in trouble if you don't totally understand the settings. It's always going to be advantageous to you as a photographer to capture as much light as possible with shutter speed and aperture. Now make the shutter speed as long as possible to capture the kind of image that you are looking for. Open the aperture as far as you can to achieve the proper amount of depth of field for your image. Then you can tap into the ISO or if you're using an ISO invariant camera, go ahead and just do this in post. So sure, it can be nice to adjust the ISO and field for many images, such as night photography, even with your aperture open all the way and your shutter speed set to 30 seconds. If you leave your ISO at base, which for most cameras is 64 or 100 or 250 or whatever, it's going to show a completely black image, which can make it more difficult to see what you're actually shooting in the field. Now, additionally, a lot of photo editors only allow for you to increase the exposure by five or four stops. While there is a workaround in most of them, it's just easier to get it closer to the true exposure value in the field. So by now, you're probably confused and wondering what I'm actually telling you to do. If you've got an ISO invariant camera, my recommendation is this. Always use your camera's base ISO for images where you can gather enough light by using shutter speed and aperture. In situations where you have to speed up the shutter or stop down the aperture and your camera's base ISO isn't enough to gather enough light, I will always underexpose my images. Don't underexpose so far that you can't see the photo on the back of your screen, but instead you ideally are gonna expose about two stops or one and a half stops under after properly setting the shutter speed and aperture. If you need to raise the ISO, you can to get there. Now having an ISO invariant sensor allows you to expose without penalty, helping you to avoid blowing out the highlights, which you can't bring back later. With all that being said, keep in mind if your camera does have dual native ISO, uh, you may wanna consider jumping to that second native ISO if the image is severely underexposed at the base ISO for your camera. All right, now that was a lot, but hopefully it makes sense to you. I know I don't have all the technical definitions, but my goal is to break things down in a way that makes sense to you. Now, if you have any questions about the whole process, please let me know down below in the comments. I'm happy to help you out. Otherwise, be sure to like and subscribe to help me grow my channel so that I can keep bringing you guys these free weekly tutorials to help you become a better photographer. Thanks again for checking it out, guys. We'll see you next time.